All right, class. So today we'll start the new topic, which is dynamic optimization. So, so far we were talking about static optimization. Uh, so to start the dynamic optimization, let's use the latest technology that we have at our disposal, which is YouTube. And let's try to, so, so far we have been using the technology of 10,000 BC, which is Blackboard and Chalk. So today let's use the technology of 2020s and try the, try the new way of educating people. Okay. So this is uh, the recent video from SpaceX. This is a rocket that came back uh, to the base station, to the launch pad. So let's look at the entire video. So this is a rocket that was launched uh, some time ago. Let's just watch the video and then we'll get started. So that's pretty much it. Uh, so what was the, uh, what happened here? So the rocket went to the space, then after the first stage was over, the rocket separated from the rest of the spacecraft, and then it came back to the launch pad. And it came exactly where the launch pad was, okay? It didn't go one millimeter here and there, it came exactly at that particular location. So how was this possible? What happened in the entire process? So this was given as an assignment uh, to you guys to watch the video and come up with what did you notice, what did you observe throughout the video? Something peculiar that you observed, yeah. Does it case they will move this to try to make it as kind of smooth as possible? Uh huh. So it kind of minimize the, the jerk, I guess, of, kind of the rockets, so kind of not having to keep correcting and incorrecting. So trying to like keep it unstable, stable path. Okay, so it was going through a stable path and it came back to the location. So you are trying to minimize the distance from that particular location, from the launch pad. Okay, so one observation he made is that it came back, the, it's trying to minimize the distance between the launch pad and itself. Um, any other thoughts? Subject to fuel constraints. Subject to fuel constraints, wonderful. Anything else? Yes. Right, so it was, it was slower in speed, in, in velocity, when it was slower to the launch pad, great. Anything else? Anything else? The chopsticks had to move too. Sorry? So the chopsticks that caught it, was, uh -huh. they were moving as well. That's right, that's right. It was moving as well. Anything else? It had to remain upright through the whole yeah, it had to remain upright because that's how it will get caught. Um, wonderful, okay, it has to remain upright. Uh, have any of you heard about inverted pendulum? Inverted pendulum? So this is an inverted pendulum actually, but it's an inverted pendulum in a 3D space, not in a 2D space. Okay, so most of you have, might have studied inverted pendulum in many of the feedback controls class. So those are generally restricted to a 1D space or a 2D space, but this one is actually in a 3D space. So it's a much more complicated inverted pendulum problem. Anything else that you notice? I want you guys to notice the, uh, the exhaust from the rocket engine, okay? When it is closer to the earth. Are you guys noticing something unusual? It's fire. We can see the fire from the left to right. 
Yeah, you will see that the notice, you will notice that the, the direction of the exhaust is moving around. Okay, it's not static. It's not that the exhaust is moving in one direction. It's actually moving around. And if you look at the bottom, I think there are 11 different exhausts at the bottom of the... Uh, so there are 11 uh, different uh, uh, places from which the exhaust is coming out and they are turning on and off each of those, ex uh, each of those uh, engines uh, in order to make sure that the rocket is always upright. Okay, anything else that you guys notice? Yeah. Well, I was curious how they account for like, potentially unpredictable environmental things. Like right, so the question is how do we, how do they know, how do they account for the unpredictable wind movement, any of the other disturbances that might come. Um, they could also have a, a collision with the bird, for instance, you know, that's also possible. So how do they account for some of those issues? Sorry? PID control. PID control, okay. So we are going back to 3551 PID control. So they might be using PID control for uh, controlling this rocket. Well, uh, <laughs> PID control will not work actually. Why? <laughs> uh, we'll get to it in a bit. It's a bit complicated to answer, but I think by mid-November or late November, we'll get to the, that particular question. Yeah. Could they use something like an extended column filter? That's for state estimation, yeah. So that's assuming that their sensors are all noisy, which they are noisy, so they would be using Kalman filter there. Okay, wonderful. Um, any other observation before we turn off the video and start using 10,000 BC technology to, <laughs> to start the lecture? Okay. So I think a uh, few things we notice first, the direction of engine exhaust was changing. Rocket needed to be upright. robust to to wind direction and we don't know why hopefully by end of november you will know what was the other thing that we noticed it came back to this original point Came back to launch pad. What was the other thing we noticed? There was fuel constraint. So fuel was one constraint. Was there any other constraint on the system? The power of the engine. Power of the engine. There was also multiple actuators. I think there were 11 engines. Uh, Maybe the angle of the engine. Angle of the engine? Yeah, I think I've written a direction of the engine exhaust was changing. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Like, 
the heat on the rocket body itself? Uh, that's not really a constraint from an optimization perspective. Yeah. Right, okay. So, yeah, the, the velocity was controlled. Controlled closer to Earth. Anything else? No? Maybe you think the uh, landing pad is some kind of convex set of where it could land in some range? Yeah, actually there was some, uh, you, you mentioned another thing that the launch pad itself was moving. Okay, so now uh, Elon Musk comes to you and says we need to find, we need to build this rocket which comes back to the launch pad. How would you go about thinking about this particular problem? Now that you have taken a big course in optimization, how would you set up the problem statement? There's still a few things that's not written here, so I want to draw your attention to that. But. Uh, how would we want to set up this as an optimization problem that needs to be solved? So that's the question. There's the thing that is not here is that the rocket has a rigid body dynamics. So it has a rigid body dynamics, which means that, of course, it's, the rocket is going to maintain its shape throughout the process. Okay? So what the problem statement actually is that the rocket is supposed to reach the launch pad, or at least very close to the launch pad, so that the launch pad can catch the rocket. It has to get to the launch pad upright it has to come back to the launch pad upright. Where did I say it was upright? Yeah. It's supposed to come back to the launch pad upright. Uh, the only control or the most important control you have is that you have engine, you, you have an engine, you have built an engine where the exhaust can potentially change direction in order to get it to the location, get it to the launch pad. The but then it's, it's not, the engine is not very powerful. There are fuel constraints and then there is power constraint on the rocket engine. Uh, but you do have multiple engines in order to control the rocket, the exhaust of the, uh, the direction of the engine exhaust, which basically tells you what kind of forces you are, uh, what kind of forces you are applying on that rigid body. Uh, you want the velocity to be as close to zero as possible, closer to the launch pad, right? So that's another uh, requirement. And what did we miss? I think that's pretty much it. So that was our, uh, that's how you would translate that business requirement of getting the launch, getting the rocket back to the launch pad. That's a business requirement. We'll convert it into, a, into an optimization formulation and so in order to get it into an optimization formulation, what do we need? Uh, we, need to what the, we need to know what the rigid body dynamics of that rocket looks like. Uh, we need to know what the control action, how does the con control action influences the dynamics of that body. And then I have some trajectory constraints on the system. And I have some terminal constraint on the system. I have a terminal cost on the system, and then I have a bunch of constraints that is imposed on that particular system. Okay, so any questions so far? Now we'll convert it into a mathematical equation. How can we, sure, how can we ensure that we haven't under constrained our problem? Because I mean, you could say something like the Coriolis effect is gonna play into the catch of the rocket, but we didn't explicitly say that was a constraint. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. So all of those things will be uh, imposed, it's part of the rigid body dynamics, okay? 
Um, so if you have any other complicated, so there are two things you can do. One is either, either, you can either approximate the rigid body dynamics or you can have a very accurate rigid body dynamics. And the level of approximation depends on the application that you're looking at. Okay, any other question? Okay. Okay, so how, how do we uh, put it in a mathematical format? So I have a state of the system which is given by xt. So this is state at time t, xt, which is a vector in Rn. So let's, let's, uh, we are going to change the notation a little bit here. So this is no longer the optimization variable, but we'll give it the name xt because that's how 99% of the papers are written. And then we have an action on the system, which is ut in Rm. We have a running cost. which is CT of XT UT. We have a terminal cost, which is C capital T plus one, X capital T plus one. That's it. It's just a cost on the terminal state. And then we have constraint, action, action set. which is ut. Didn't we already define ut? Uh, ut is a subset of Rm. Is that different than the action on the system? Uh, so the action is basically a point in ut. We'll eventually say that the action is constrained to be in ut because you have fuel constraints and you have power constraint on the rocket. Anything else that we have missed out? So the action set is, what are the possible actions you can take on the system? Okay, so for instance, the engine has certain power constraints. So that's the most, that's the maximum amount of action you can actually take on the system. Okay. Uh, it also turns out that there would be a state space so this we call it action set sometimes people call it action space as well uh, and then there is a state space which i'm going to denote by capital xt which is also a subset of rn these are all the possible states that you will visit so if you look at the rocket for instance the rocket state space would comprise of okay let's think about Let's think about the state of the system for this particular rocket for a little bit. But I want to make sure that we have covered everything. So we have covered the running cost. We have covered the terminal cost. We have covered, oh, we have not talked about the dynamics. So the dynamics is, let me write it here. Xt plus 1 equals to Ft of xt ut that's my dynamics so we have taken care of the dynamics we have taken care of the constraints we have taken care of the terminal cost uh, we have not taken care of the robustness part yet okay we'll take care of it in four or five lectures from now uh, uh, rocket needed to be upright. Where exactly is this coming up in that expression? Rocket needed to be upright. The state of the system? Correct. Not the state. No. Sorry? Dynamics. dynamics. So dynamics is telling me what the rocket is going to look like if you apply this particular action to the system. So what the next state is going to look like if we apply the action and the current state 
is xt. Sorry? Turbulent cost? Uh, rocket needed to be upright throughout the process. Sorry. Running cost. Okay, it's part of the running cost. So, rocket needs to be upright and the velocity is to be controlled, which is very close to zero, closer to the launch pad. Those are all part of the running cost of the system. Uh, the direction of engine exhaust was changing. So this part, how to change the direction of the engine exhaust, we haven't talked about it yet. We'll get to it in a bit. And whether it's robust to wind direction or not, we'll get to it in four or five lectures. So these are the two things that we don't know yet. But the rest of the stuff has already been taken care of in this particular set of expressions. Let's try to figure out what the state of the system is going to look like. So what is the state of the system? The way you define the state of the system is the minimum number of uh, variables that you need to keep track of so that if you know those variables and if you know what action you picked, you can actually predict the variables at the next point of time. Okay? It's the minimum number of variables. So let's spend a little bit of time trying to figure out what exactly is the state of this system. So here is my rocket. It looks like a rocket, so it must be a rocket. Okay. Uh, so what is my state? What does XT comprise of? So what's the minimum number of variables you want to track about this rocket so that you can predict, based on the actions taken, you can predict what the next state is going to look like. Yeah. Um, like X, Y, Z and rotation. Okay, so position. Position in X, Y, Z coordinates. Origin would be the? What would be the origin on this coordinate space? Um, launch pad. Typically, it should be launch pad. Okay, so origin is launch pad. So position in the x, y, z coordinates, what else? Okay. Roll, pitch, yaw. So roll, pitch, yaw is basically related to, let's say the rocket is moving in this direction. Then it's basically angles that it makes with different axes. So that's roll, pitch, and yaw. What other thing do I need to know? Current engine angles. That's part of the roll pitch here. I mean, the angle of the engines. You can. Uh, is that part of the state or action? Uh, I mean, stage. So you need to know current engine angles. Otherwise, I mean, you cannot change that immediately. You need. It's continuous. Well, in this particular case, actually, you can change it immediately. You've seen it in the video. They were changing it quite. I mean, from left to right. Right. It takes time, right? Okay. Uh, we'll keep the current angle, angle of exhaust. What else? Somebody had raised the hand, yeah. The XYZ velocity. XYZ velocity. Velocity, XYZ direction. Anything else? Yeah. So would the strength of the action be part of the action? It will be part of the action set. The strength would be the action set. Yeah. Does current amount of fuel matter in this? Amount of fuel. Let's think about it. Uh, we can keep track of amount of fuel, OK? We can definitely keep track of amount of fuel, but I don't think how it materially influences the actions that we can take. Because if there isn't enough fuel, then you are basically going to disintegrate midway. Can we also take into account the velocity of the roll pitch in y'all? It's, like it's 
six. Why not? Why not? Let's just keep it. And their time derivative. Okay. Current engine output. Current engine output. So you have the current angle, and then okay, let me put the engine output. Anything else that matters to the engine, to the rocket? Do we need to consider the current fuel, the amount of fuel, since it changes the mass of our sun? Yeah, it's already there, amount of fuel. Actually, the amount of fuel is important. Yeah because that changes the mass of the system. So the mass itself is a variable in this particular problem statement. When you're driving the vehicle, mass is not really that important. But when you are, when you are driving a rocket, it becomes important. <laughs> so maybe not fuel could be exchangeable for mass of the rocket? That's right. So that's why this thing is important. Engine output, anything else? How about the, yeah. Temperature, I really don't know how it would be important. Uh, one thing that I will tell you, so, I, so actually I have a PhD in aerospace, so I kind of know a little bit about aerospace, not a whole lot. Uh, I'm an applied mathematician wearing the robes of aerospace engineer, but I'm not an aerospace engineer at all, by any stretch of imagination, okay? Uh, but it does turn out that uh, when you are looking at the rocket engine, the temperature of the rocket engine does matter. So if you have a cold start, then you have to start it in a very specific way. Uh, but after the rocket engine is ignited, then controlling it is a, another beast. And then the temperature of the rocket really matters in those situations. I mean, temperature of the engine, but that's just the engine. So engine is sort of not the same as the entire rocket. Engine is a small sub part of that whole rocket system. Okay. I don't know whether they are using liquid or solid. I'm, most likely it will be liquid fuel because solid fuel, it just kind of burns. I mean, it, you cannot stop it. I was thinking of maybe there's some kind of fluid dynamics that we have to take into account. Uh, right, that will be the function FT. So FT will take into account all the fluid dynamics, not of the engine, but of the, the body interacting with the fluid. What is the fluid here? Air. air. So anything that we need to, we need to think about the air, The wind velocity, yeah, wind velocity, and then density. Density does influence the dynamics, FT, is influenced by the density of the air uh, that's around the rocket, okay? So if you think about rocket, uh, there are a whole bunch of variables that you need to keep track of in order to come up with the dynamics of the system. Uh, by the way, I think some of the, well, okay, let's just keep it as a state. So there are some things that are parameters, so that's not really the state of the system, but those are parameters that influences the dynamics. But let's just put everything in the state of the system for now, because we don't have a parameter set here. Uh, okay. Action, we have already talked about the direction and the strength of the engine, or one of the 11 engines, that's the action of the system. So if you have 11 engines there, then this M is 11. So UT is an R11. Uh, you could also have a few rudders and so on, but those don't really influence the, uh, they, do, they do help a lot with the attitude control of the rocket, but that's not the main control uh, action for that particular rocket. Okay, so, so after we have identified, okay, let me put another thing here. Uh, I'm going to add some more variables that you may find obnoxious, but I want you to tell me why it is obnoxious. So let me put a temperature of moon. Uh, number of whales in ocean. So I've added two more variables here in the state of the system. And I want you to 
Tell me what your thoughts are. Yes. Is somehow related to gravity? No, it's not. Yeah. I mean, the proportion of how it affects the rocket's state compared to the other ones is negligible. Negligible. So the temperature of the moon and the number of whales in the ocean, uh, yes, they get updated. But it has nothing to do with the rest of the variables that influences the rocket. OK? So what do we include in the state and what do we not include in the state? That's the question. And the point I'm trying to make is you can come up with hundreds of variables in XT. And then you will realize that some of the variables are not really important for modeling the system or modeling the, the dynamics of the system. And so that's why the state of the system is minimal number of variables needed to predict itself. That's the minimal number of variables needed to predict itself, depending on the influence exerted by the action that you have imposed on the system. So these two things don't affect the rest of the stuff. There is something else that the, the action doesn't really influence, which is the wind velocity and the air density. The air density and wind velocity is something that the action doesn't really influence. Action of the rocket doesn't really influence, but it is still an important state of the system. Okay? It is still something that you need to measure because that influences the dynamics of the system. Okay? It influences all the other things that influences the system. Any other question? Any, any thoughts, comments? OK, so once you have identified, these are the things. These are the important parameters of the system. And this is the minimal number of parameters of the system, uh, which uh, we'll call the state of the system. Then we need to use the laws of physics, chemistry, biology, civics, economics, whatever, to come up with this function FT. OK, so this FT maps state XT cross action set UT to xt plus 1. For the purpose of this particular class, I'm going to assume that ft is a continuous and differentiable function. Any question so far? So no matter what system you might be looking at, you may be looking at a car battery. You may be looking at a, a petri dish of stem cells. You might be looking at the virus influencing, I don't know, the population on the planet. Right? So there are all these different problems where there is a notion of state, and the state gets updated based on the action you take. So if you look at the virus, the action you are taking is uh, inoculation of people, vaccination. Uh, if you're looking at the electric vehicle battery, you are, the actions you are picking is how much you want to charge or discharge that particular vehicle during each of the drive cycles. If you're looking at stem cells in a petri dish, uh, you want to take the action so that those stem cells gets converted into heart cells, lung cells, I don't know, liver cells or whatever. I don't know much about the biology stuff also. So, but there are people who are, I don't know, figuring out how to convert stem cells to different types of organs within the body. And so they do have some, some actions that they can take in order to convert the stem cells into heart cells or lung cells or whatever, some other form of cells. That technology is still a bit, uh, bit premature at this point of time, but people are working on it. Uh, you could have immunity within the body. So XT could be the immunity within the body, and UT could be like the actions that you are taking on the body. You can be taking drugs. You can be taking uh, drips, uh, and I don't know, a lot, can, a lot of other things in order to change the immunity of the system, immunity of the body. OK, so that's the dynamics part of it. And then there is the running cost and the terminal cost. And you need to design the running cost and terminal cost based on the objective that you want to achieve for that particular system. So in the case of this rocket, we wanted the rocket to come back to the launch pad. But we also wanted the rocket to be upright at all points of time. 
and we wanted uh, a specific trajectory, the rocket to follow a specific trajectory so that it can, you know, one of the things, by the way, I, I, I don't know if you're aware, but the rockets are always launched closer to the ocean and their trajectory is picked so that it is going to remain on the ocean for a very long, long period of time. So that if in case that mission needs to be aborted, they can just blow up the rocket and the debris will fall in the ocean and not on people. Okay, so that's an important consideration as well. So you want the running cost of the rocket to be such that uh, you are maintaining its trajectory along a certain path and you want to minimize the running cost as well as you want to minimize the terminal cost of the system. So let's try to formulate what the problem is what the optimization problem is. So I want to minimize CT plus 1, XT plus 1, plus summation T equals 0. Should we start with 0 or 1? Okay, 0 is good. Capital T, CT of XT UT. What are the constraints here? I want to minimize this. So I want to find out what are the constraints and what am I minimizing over. So what am I minimizing over in this case? Control action. Control action. So I'm minimizing over U1 all the way up to U capital T. Uh, what are the constraints here? What are the constraints? No, constraints have to be based on the stuff that we have talked about. X of T is in capital X of T. Okay. X of T is in capital X of T. What else? Actions have to be in the action set. Uh -huh. Actions have to be in action set. Mm-hmm. Dynamics, very good. Xt plus 1 equals to Ft, Xt ut. Anything else? No, I think that's it. That's pretty much all the constraints we have. So we have state constraints, we have action constraints, we have the dynamics as a constraint to this optimization problem. So the question is, we need to solve this optimization problem. How would you solve this optimization problem? What would you do? Let's say the UT looks like box set, zero less than equal to UT less than equal to some B. Let's say XT looks like some X bar T minus delta less than equal to xt less than equal to x bar t plus delta. So my state constraint, my action constraint, it looks something like this. How did you decide those? Were they just arbitrary? Or? Uh, not quite arbitrary. Uh, you know, people have experience and based on the experience, they kind of decide what kind of sort of x bar t should look like. So x bar t should be over the ocean, it should be away from shipping containers. It should be away from cities. So, okay, this is what the trajectory should look like. And then you can be within certain bounds of that particular trajectory. How would we solve this particular optimization problem? What would you do? You are the mission commander of SpaceX. <laughs> yeah. You will? Uh, linearization. linearization of the dynamic dynamics. Yeah. Uh, let's say that you have, in, you have infinite computational power to solve this problem. So linearization is not really needed. We'll get to the linearization 
maybe not in this course, maybe in some other course in the future. Um, we'll go with the original nonlinear dynamics here. How do I solve this problem? Come on, you guys have, you, you should know how to solve this problem. Manifold suboptimization. Manifold suboptimization? Well, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you use manifold or not because you, know, you never know if this is a, a convex constraint or not. But basically, you will use Lagrange multiplier theory to solve problems of this type. So we have learned, I think, four different methods, sequential quadratic programming, barrier method, augmented Lagrangian method, and method of multipliers. And then we have learned about penalty method as well in the previous class. So we've learned four methods to solve constrained optimization problems of this type. And we can pick one of those algorithms to solve this constrained optimization problem, right? The problem with that particular approach, okay, who can tell me what the problem with that approach is? So let's think about it. Uh, what do you think this capital T is in the rocket problem? What is capital T? So we have written it in discrete time. Let's say time t equals 0 to t equals to 1 is 10 milliseconds. Okay? So one time step equals to 10 milliseconds here. This is typically the time slot in vehicles, by the way. Most of the processes are at 10 millisecond kind of time scale. Some of them could be one millisecond time scale. So one time step here, I'm assuming it's 10 milliseconds for the time being. What is the capital T here? Yeah. It's not fixed, it could be variable. Uh, let's try to fix it. Let's try to fix it. Let's say uh, the entire mission, so how, how long would be the mission of this rocket? The rocket has to go from launch pad to maybe like 50 kilometers or so and then come back to the launch pad. What's the mission time? 30 minutes, okay. So 30 minutes equals to 30 into 60 seconds equals to 30 into 60 into 1000 millisecond. So my capital T is, how much is my capital T now? 180. Thousand? No. One point eight million? Yeah, I'm dividing it by ten milliseconds. I'm dividing it by ten milliseconds. So how many zeros do I have? One, two, three, four. No, I have five zeros here, okay. One eighty thousand. So my capital T is one eighty thousand in this particular example. And my UT, so I said that there are 11 engines there. So my UT is in R11. Uh, so what am I solving? So this minimization problem is over how many variables? What's the dimension of this minimization problem? Let me put it 10. OK, I, I want to make it simple. So what's the dimension over which I'm minimizing this whole whole optimization problem. So it's 1.8 million. Okay, so you are uh, sending a rocket in space, you are trying to get the rocket back to the Earth. Uh, you came up with an optimization formulation and you're very excited to apply method of multipliers to solve this optimization problem. And next thing you know is you're solving an optimization problem that has 1.8 million dimension. Are you excited now or no? <laughs> okay. So we are no longer excited at the prospect of being the mission commander of the SpaceX mission. We should be able to do better. Okay, how do we do better? What should we do?
Well, the mission commander needs to sit in ECE 5500 and sit through my 12 or 13 lectures on dynamic optimization. That's what they need to do. Okay. So we need to come up with a way to solve this problem. Okay. Let's try to simplify the problem a little bit for now. Okay. And let's try to assume that xt is Rn. and ut is rm. Let's try to uh, so x1 equals to f0 of x0 u0 x2 equals to f1 of x1 u1 which is f1 of F0 of X0 U0 U1 X3 and so on. I am looking at the following problem now. I don't have this state constraint and I don't have the action constraint. I only have the dynamics constraint. I can't get rid of this constraint, right? Then we don't have anything to optimize if I get rid of the dynamics. Okay, so what I can do is I can write xt as a function phi t of this vector u, where this vector u is u0, u1, all the way up to ut, u capital T. Let me simplify further. Let me assume that ct is identically zero. So I don't even have this running cost. I only have a terminal cost. Now I've made my life much, much easier. So I only have a terminal cost. I have the dynamics. I want to optimize over all u1 to ut. And what I've noticed is if I look at each of my x, it's actually a function of the entire trajectory of u that I'm going to be picking. And whenever I see a problem of this type, I think the first thing we always do is find out what the necessary condition for optimality is, right? That's what we've been doing so far. So I want to find out what the necessary condition for optimality is for this particular problem. So goal, find. necessary condition. Okay, so I was facing a very complicated problem, so I made some assumptions. I made the assumption that my xt is entire rn, my ut is entire rm, my running cost is identically zero. And then I noticed that each of these xt's can be written in the form of a function phi t of this entire trajectory of uh, uh, variable u0 all the way up to ut. And this is the, remember, this is the variable over which I'm optimizing. Okay, this should start with u0 here. Uh, so I'm optimizing over this entire uh, over this entire vector, and this is the vector that's sitting in R 1.8 million. 
and I want to find the necessary condition for optimality. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate the dynamics. So whenever you have an equality constraint in the system, what does it mean? It means that you can eliminate a lot of variables from within that particular uh, optimization problem. So if you remember in the first assignment, you were solving this problem of C1 of X1 plus C2 of X2, such that X1 plus X2 was equal to 1,000. And how did you eliminate this variable X2? You said, I'm going to minimize C1 of X1 plus C2 of 1,000 minus X1, right? That's how you eliminated the variable. That, that's what you did in assignment one. <clears throat> so I'm going to eliminate this particular equality constraint completely. And how do I eliminate it? I'm now minimizing over this vector u of ct plus 1 phi t of this vector u. Actually, I should probably say phi t plus 1 because it's xt plus 1. So this problem and this problem are equivalent. Are you all convinced that the two problems are equivalent, the two optimization problems are equivalent? I'll pause here for questions. So I wanted to minimize this, this cost subject to this constraint. This constraint is for all time steps t. For all time steps t equals 0 to t. So I had like 1.8 million constraints here. But what I did was I figured out that actually I can write xt plus 1 as a function of the entire trajectory. And then I can get rid of all this. Uh, all this equality constraint business and I just put that particular function here. And now I'm minimizing this over R 1.8 million. What's a, uh, what is the necessary condition for optimality here for this particular problem? The derivative should be equal to zero. So I want the derivative of ct plus 1 of phi t plus 1 of u star to be equal to 0, right? That's lecture 4 or 5 or something like that. OK, so now I need to unpack this particular expression. OK, I need to figure out. What is this uh, derivative? So phi t plus 1 is not random. Phi t plus 1 is not just any function. It is composition of multiple functions. You can see phi 1 is f1 composition with f0. Phi 2 is f2 composition with f1 composition of f0, and so on and so forth. So there is a pattern in this phi t plus 1. So maybe if I unpack this particular expression, uh, I might get something really cool. Okay. So let's try to figure out what that leads to. Oh, uh, actually, we'll unpack it in the next class. Okay, so till then, you can think about this expression, and then we'll talk about it in the next class. Thank you. <laughs>